Today's guest is Robert Indriesh, who has overcome humble beginnings in a developing country to build an empire of eight businesses across 14 time zones, generating seven figures annually uh, with achievements, including generating over 500 million for his own clients and consulting over 1000 professional. Robert brings a wide range of experience. So Robert, thank you very much for coming on. How are you today? Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, I must say I'm very excited for the call. Good. Uh, I'm excited that you're excited because, uh, like I said, this isn't really the the, the, the typical uh, <laughs> thing that a lot of guests do. So, yeah, I mean, I know we had a, a pretty good conversation before we actually went live. So I'd love for you to just speak about, because I think like the bio that I read, even though I don't know like much about you, I don't think really encapsulates, you know, how much of a standout entrepreneur you you actually are. So why don't you just give us a little bit more context on on who you are, what you've done, and then we can kind of dive into the rest. Sure. So um, I uh, I started my life uh, in, in my first few years on farms. Um, we were you know um, walking the cows, feeding the chicken, working the land, you know, doing all of that cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I enjoyed that for uh, quite a while. We didn't really have money for many things. We did have money for food and so on and so forth. So that was fine. I, it was not like I was starving or anything, but there there were days when you know, I would have, you know, a few slices of bread and then some, an onion or whatever, <laughs> you know, but you don't care when you're young, you know, you just, it's a day, you know, that's it. The day passed, you ate something, you went on, you know, you didn't really feel hunger. I don't know when we were younger, we didn't think in terms of that. And, um, then at one point, um, whenever I would want to buy anything, we wouldn't have money. But something I could buy was books. If I wanted to buy a book, we would always magically have money somehow. And I love that, right? Even now as an adult myself, you know, I look at my parents and like, guys, you guys were genius. That's amazing. So at one point, I bought a, a book, uh, which I really love. To this day, I own that book. It's changed my life. It's called The Evolution of Technology. And the, on the front cover there was a half dissected um, uh, vacuum cleaner, right? A Hoover. And it was crazy, like to see how the air comes in, how the machine just swirls the air inside, how it has the filters so it keeps, you know, the bad things inside, like the, the junk inside, and it just puts the, uh, the air out. It just fascinated me. I'm like, I love that. So I just went deeper into that, um, and I started learning engineering from a young age. Um, and I left my house and my hometown when I was 14. Uh, I wanted to do more uh, with my life, so I left. And uh, I didn't leave on too good terms, so I had to work and fend for myself when I was younger. I had all jobs, like uh, I was a lumberjack at one point, or um, I was uh, building furniture, or I was uh, on... Uh, in a manufacturing plant, you know, just moving stuff, you know, on the, the line. And then at one point I got my first engineering client. It was a manufacturing plant that I used to work for. And uh, they wanted to automatize their entire plant uh, with various things, you know, that uh, they were doing manually. And I was talking to them about it, long story short, because I know we don't have a, a lot of time. Long story short, I ended up convincing them to give me the project so that I do it. Uh, they didn't believe me, you know, they're laughing like, no, you can't do it. Obviously you can't. We're talking to a development agency in Budapest, you know, and I managed to get the number out of them of how much they're paying, you know, because they didn't want to tell me because I was making so little. And uh, I was like, look, just, I can, I can do it for half the price. <laughs> and they're like, nah, come on, you can't. It's like, look, just give me two weeks. And listen, that's all I'm asking for. I know what you need. Just give me two weeks, pay me as if I would come to work, but let me stay home and work. And I can come back with something with a with a prototype, and they said, "Okay, sure. I think like money is not an issue. At least that much money for millionaires, you know. Like, sure, go home and and see. Like, I don't think they believe me. But then I actually did it, and I showed them what I did. Like, I was automatizing everything, every part of the process on their computer. They couldn't believe it, and they were looking. They're baffled. They're, they couldn't believe that it was actually done in two weeks because they were going to pay a serious amount." To this, you know, very big company in Budapest, and I managed to to do that in a couple of weeks. They gave me feedback, and I implemented the feedback in a few days, a week, whatever. 
you know, it, it went well. And so they were shocked. They paid me very handsomely for that. And then I said, okay, so this is the way. Like, this is what I want to do. Engineering is what I want to do. So um, spoiler, I was around 15 at the time when I did that. So after that, I kept getting more projects, more projects, more projects. By the time I was around 18, I was making more than both my parents combined. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go to university. I was like, why go? Wasted my time. Both of my parents went to university and you know they're not making a lot. So why would I? Blah, blah, blah. Eventually, my mom, my mom convinced me to go to uni and I went, which is fine. Uh, four years of my life, I'm never going to get back. But you know, I also did some cool stuff. So I, I, can't, I can't say I'm not happy. You know, it was nice. And so um, I did that and then... Uh, started my own company at one point. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be uh, an employee, but I worked in other companies and I realized they couldn't care less about me. You know, was, I have so many stories I'm not going to go into today, but I realized that it's not for me. I said, okay, let me start my own company. Let me show these guys how it's done, how you should treat people, you know, how you should conduct business ethically. I realized it's much harder than you know, I signed up for. Uh, it took me over three years to start making money. So three years I worked every single day, weekends included. I was pulling you know, 12 hour days and I'm not exaggerating. Most people that say that don't really do it. If you analyze their day to day, they don't really do it. They just think they do. So I was time tracking my 12 hours a day, right? I was literally like crazy busy. It took me three years and I eventually broke through. And when I broke through, I made a million in under a year. And, and so that's when I was around my 25th uh, uh, years of life. And then after that, I just kept going on and on. Um, and I typically add one to three businesses into my portfolio every year. The reason why I'm at eight is because sometimes we sell. So last year, for example, we did Taplio, uh, taplio.com. We worked on it for a few months. We launched it. In two months, we made a quarter million dollars. And then by month three, it was sold. Right. So, um, uh, multiple seven figure uh, buyout. So it was, uh, and that keeps happening over and over again. So we sold a couple other companies since then. So um, that's me in a nutshell. I don't know. I guess I answered your question to, to some extent. Uh, oh, and I used to do consulting. I consulted with over 300 businesses until now. And um, I've generated over half a billion in business value for them. That's a new revenue generated. That's in cutting costs that's in, you know, not making mistakes that would have otherwise caused them hundreds of thousands or millions or whatever, you know, so, um, and then my portfolio is very varied. We do uh, engineering. Again, that's one of my businesses. Another one of my businesses does marketing. Another one is an Airbnb for luggage. We have, I think, 75 locations in the UK and we're just moving to the US. We have like 15, I think this year we've started. So we have like 65 locations or 90 locations there. Um, I have um, a card game for couples so that they experience more love, joy, and connection. Uh, we've won um, Most Innovative Game of the Year Award in the UK, where we've invented it, um, so on and so forth. They have nothing to do with one another, the businesses, but it's just things I, I enjoy and I feel make the world a better place somehow. Love it. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that because I think it highlights so many beautiful qualities of yourself and also of like what it looks like when you get to that point where you can actually self-actualize and like you can actually do the things you love to do i think it's illustrated most by like the last sentiment of like yes i have this portfolio of businesses like they're really like things i'm passionate about i'm interested in and it's like that's what drives me to actually do them and excel at them and and really it's like the like it, it then and i've heard clients that are also like in your boat where like they're kind of they've gone through the trials and tribulations to like be quote unquote like uh successful as far as like the societal metrics it's like well now it becomes a game now it becomes something that i get to enjoy and then what i'm wanting to explore is like okay well how can i get more of that joy how can i excel further when it's like my needs are covered but now it's like kind of like what's that next thing how do i express it how do i find a deeper fulfillment a deeper peace in it a deeper joy in it so if you want to comment or add anything to that full floor is yours um 
something that um, I think is uh, is very interesting is that um, once you dive deeper into how biochemistry works in the body and how we always regulate, always, it's always yin and yang. You cannot be constantly joyous. You cannot be constantly happy and so on. And I thought you can. I really did. Like when you're young and you see all of these books and these courses and, you know, it's like, oh, this is the route to happiness and fulfillment and blah, blah, blah. And then you actually do it. And then you get so pissed one day and, you know, uh, you get so sad another day or whatever. I'm like, why am I here? Like, I don't need this stuff. Like, why, why am I going through this? And then you realize that everything is yin and yang. So if, if you have a base rate of happiness, let's say, like Zen, that's what Zen is called, right? You're never happy. You're never sad. People believe, by the way, people believe Zen means you're happy all the time. No, <laughs> it means you're not happy, but you're not sad either. You, you completely attach and you completely detach at the same time. It's crazy good when you, you actually understand it, right? But, but, but Zen doesn't mean you're, you're, you're you know, happy. So the Zen means calm, right? So it means like you, you've attained a, a level of, of understanding of the world in which you don't need to prove anything to anyone and especially not to yourself, right? You just go through the world and, and you can just be yourself and do anything you want, right? It's, it's without restraints. Uh, obviously, no one gets there, right? The Buddha maybe got there and Jesus maybe got there, you know, but that's about it, you know, so, or Muhammad or whatever people, you know, whomever is the Messiah, you know, they probably got to Zen and then everyone levitated around them. So basically, um, you, you believe these things that, you know, I can be perpetually happier, I can be whatever. And this is part of what just driving your unhappiness. Because I remember a few years ago, at one point, I was in my couch, in my home in the UK, uh, three-story house, no issues. You know, we have everything. We had a fully, fully electric, you know, luxury car outside. I was looking at the ceiling and I had nothing to do. Nothing. I was like, nothing. And I was really trying. I was like, should I do this? I oh, know someone's handling that. Should we do that? No, that's handle. Should I do? I literally, I was going through the motions of every cog in each one of my businesses and thinking, what should I do now? And the answer every time was nothing. You should not step on any toes. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't. Everything is taken care of. Everything is growing. You know, we've had years when our portfolio would grow 481%. It was like crazy. Like no one makes that money, that, that much money that quickly, right? Like you put in $1 now, you make five the next year. It's like crazy. So had huge growth um, and so on. And I was just watching the ceiling and nothing was happening. And then I realized that, okay, I've made it because this is what you fight for, right? For your entire career. You want to be, get to the point in which you just make money every month and you don't need to move a finger. That's it. And so I, I came after a couple of days of watching the ceiling. I'm like, this is it. I've made it. And guess what? I wasn't happier. And I was, I was just, what do I do now? And you become confused. You're like, okay, and now what? You know, when I was younger, I used to play video games. I thought that, you know, when, when I, and I really enjoyed them, right? And so I said, when I'm going to be filthy rich, you know, I can do anything I want. I can just play video games all day. Well, guess what? You don't feel like playing video games when you can do so much with your time. Like, you know, oh, my God, I could be doing this. I could be doing that. You know, the last thing I think about is going to kill some boars, you know, in, in whatever forest, you know, I need to do whatever quest someone randomly told me to do. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. You know, just, I, I maybe, I sometimes, you know, reminisce of the good old times when I really didn't have any responsibilities. These are on the days when, you know, so in a, in a portfolio of eight businesses with hundreds of employees across all of the planet, every single day, there's a fire every day, every day. And anyone in any big business that tells you otherwise does not, is not aware of what's going on in the business. There's a fire somewhere. You just don't know about it. And if you don't know about it, that's not necessarily good. <laughs> you know, if you, you should have a good pulse on everything, right? Not that you have to look at it every day, but if you're really interested in how the business is going, you should be able to find out if there's a fire in a department with a client or whatever, right? So um, this goes back to what you were saying, right? It's, you, you get to a point in which you say, okay, it's a game fine you think it's easy no it never becomes easier this is this is another weird thing 
Do you know cold showers? I don't know if you've ever taken those. I've at one point, you know, because I read all of the books and so on and so forth on every subject that's, you know, personal development. And and I'm like, okay, cold showers is the thing, you know, uh, increase, you know, brown fat cells, you know, which increase metabolic rate, reduce inflammation, but 12 different things, you know, I can go over. Okay, cold showers it is. Started doing cold showers. In my life, I've never had the problem of discipline. Never. If I say I'm going to do something, I just get around, do it, and call it late. Took cold showers for six months straight. Every single day. I kid you not, after six months, I started swearing in the shower. Like, what the f This is not getting easy. This is painful. Why would I keep doing this to myself? I could take... Uh, my entire life from now on, I could take hot showers in an amazing place and never have to work in my life. Why would I do this to myself? I did not understand. I'm not, I'm not trying to convince anyone to not take cold showers. They're amazingly healthy, you know, but it never gets easier. You know, that's at least for me, six months. I mean, come on, how much more do you need to do until they say, oh yeah, I just take cold showers. It's jiffy. I just, like I turn it on it. I'm completely Zen. You know, I, I don't feel you know, the sting of ice cold water on my skin, you know, and so on. No, you feel it every single time. So in business, it's pretty much the same. If you want to enjoy it, you don't enjoy a game you win all the time. Try it. You're going to get bored out of your mind. You don't enjoy it. You enjoy it when you have challenge and you keep challenging yourself and doing more and doing more. And guess what? Challenging yourself means that you will fail. By default, you fail. It's part of where you're going, right? Because if you wouldn't be growing, then that means that um, you, you, would, you would already know what you need to do, including your blind spots, including everything, right? And so that means you're not really growing because you're already there. I don't know how to explain that better, but it's like you're, it's not real growth. It's only growth when you do something you've never done before, and sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail at it. But it's impossible statistically that you always succeed at it, right? You have to fail from time to time if you keep pushing yourself. And so it's just uh, my most recent failure last year was me losing $2 million. And it hurt more than anything I've ever done in my almost. Like some, some things like losing a family member hurt more. Other than that, I kid you not, it was so difficult to lose $2 million. I can't. The only thing I could tell myself is be grateful you had money to lose. Be grateful you had money to lose. But it's like it doesn't get any easier. It doesn't matter, you know, the 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 positive thinking, woo, and so on and so forth. Because in your brain, you're like, I could have done this, I could have done that. It was hundred percent avoidable, blah, 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 blah. Right? You know, you've dealt with this many times. So um and that's it and i need to be ready because now i lost two million dollars you know 10 years from now i might lose 200 million at one point in a number that you know that that i'm gonna make it is the you know the game the jungle so <laughs> that's what we deal with absolutely and i mean when while you were talking like i guess there's two main adages or quotes or whatever you want to call them that that like kept popping up into my head because you mentioned zen right so there's that and i'm probably butchering the actual quote but so on where it goes like uh like when you reach enlightenment go do laundry right the idea being like okay no matter where you've arrived it, it is the like boring rote i keep showing up doing the same thing again and again that actually gets you or keeps you kind of in, in that state right it's kind of that mm -hmm. equanimity of it's not the highs it's not the lows it's just like you are in that powerful middle where it's just like i, I can handle um you know all of it and the other one it's like the idea of like this is what hard feels like mm, you know it's okay. like it, it's yeah. everybody wants to do you know the hard thing whether it's you know my previous business was a gym so it's like the, the weight loss and the working out and, and like all of that and obviously now it's like business but it's just like like at some point this is what hard feels like and obviously yeah. cold showers definitely fall into that it's like yeah. this is what it feels like each and every single time right and i tell this to my clients all the time because for example, like I will work with somebody who oftentimes has trouble getting to or past that place or away from the, just the addiction of that place on, on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, we do a lot of this work to overcome the patterns and the woundings that keep them there. But then it's like, okay, so it's, it's not really showing up in the same way yet. This 
thing that they couldn't do or, or the attachment they had to the thing that they were doing in business, like it still kind of keeps showing up. I'm like, yeah, like what we've got rid of is the baggage of the wounding that got you here. So you're now able to, with a clean slate, go into these situations and execute on them. But fundamentally, like this is kind of what it feels like. Like if you want to swim, you have to get comfortable with being wet. Like the, the the two are intimately linked and they cannot be unlinked. So again, if you want to add anything to that, I'm happy with that. Um, you let me know. Beautiful. No, no, that's, that's great. I think you nailed it on the head with those um, very good adages. Um, and when and something else happens, I'm going to tell you after you've made more than enough money to sustain yourself. And, you know, like I, at any point in time, even if I lose all of my businesses, I can just call one of my connections and say, I need a six figure job now. And they're like, Robert, of course, full time you come on. No problem. You name the price. Right. So I can do that anytime. So I never actually need money anymore. Right. I can just get it very easily. I can just latch onto it because of the value I bring to the marketplace. Someone like that, or for myself or others, it's very hard to do things you don't want to do. Incredibly, or at least for me, right? I have this discussion with my wife all the time. Like, could you, I don't know, let me think of something that we, could you mow the lawn? I'm like, of course not. I'll pay someone to mow the lawn. Why would I pay? Why would I mow the lawn? What are you talking about? Like, yeah, but well, why would you pay someone when you could do it? So I don't want to do it. What are you talking about? You know, it's just the, I don't know. It's just such a different concept. I don't want to do it. It's like, or other times should say, why don't you you wash the dishes? I'm like, why don't we get the cleaning lady? Let's just get the cleaning lady. I don't want to wash the dishes. <laughs> you know, like, well, you we don't need a cleaning lady. You can just wash your dishes. I'm like, but I don't want to. You need to understand. I don't want to. It's like, I get it. I get if I reach, once I reach enlightenment, I'll I'll wash dishes. Until then, you know, just let me not wash. I don't want to wash them, you know. And by the way, I'm exaggerating with the dishes. Obviously, I sometimes I wash dishes and so on. I clean and, you know, this weekend I hoovered the house and so on. And I'm doing that. You know, it's like, I could be making so much money right now. You know, it's like I'm just hoovering <laughs> the floor. <laughs> it's so funny. And then, and then I'm mopping, you know. And, and, and I remember this conversation with a friend. I kid you not. I, I couldn't believe the conversation. So... Everything I don't like doing, let's say I do mediocre, right? Mediocre at it. I, I don't wash clothes perfectly. I don't hoover perfectly. I don't, you know, mop perfectly or whatever. And at one point I was mopping. And this guy, you know, uh, a friend, you know, came over or something like that. And I was mopping. And the, the water was already dirty, you know. But I was like halfway done with the house. But the water was dirty. I was like, dude, what are you doing? Like what? I'm mopping. Like, but the water is dirty. Like, well, yes, but I'm not done. Like, but you need to go change the water, put solution again, and then you know, take it from there. Like, why would I do that? Just, I'm halfway done already. Let me just use this water <laughs> until I'm done, and then call it a day. You know, and, and he's like, dude, no, you don't do that. Like, the moment it gets dirty, you change the water. I'm like, come on, I'm already struggling to do this as it is. You know, I'm not gonna change the water three times. You know, to clean my house. You know, we have a lot of square footage, you know, maybe that's why it just gets messy and, you know, I just keep having to change it. Maybe, I don't know. I just, I kid you not, I did, I, I, I mopped the, the second floor and then I came down to the first floor. Then I did change the water because I remember the guy, you know, so I did do it, but just because it was, I think Saturday or Sunday, something like that. And I really didn't care. I had time. I just said, okay, fine. I'll change the water. That's what I should do. So the point being is that it becomes very difficult to do things you don't want to do. Like you, you need to email that client. Screw it. I have enough clients. You, you know, you need to, you know, do this, do that, whatever. Like, why would I bother? You know, so it's dangerous. That's my point, right? It becomes very dangerous because um, you, you, you need to put a line and it's very di difficult to put the line between what's uncomfortable, like I don't want to talk to this client or what's unnecessary. If it's unnecessary, don't do it fine you don't want to don't do it if it's not necessary but if it's like an important client that you really have to talk to you know and they're upset like go talk to them or whatever i have no problem with that but i'm just trying to give some examples um i, I can't take think of anything pertinent um or some something i i have I, I still do to an extent is 
I check the emails my team writes. I, I don't I, I don't send emails myself or I don't read them and so on. And so anyone that emails me basically is talking to my admin team. But sometimes unique things show up. And especially when we run a new campaign, when we build the canned responses the first time, and I need to go in and actually check the drafts and then comment on them and so on. It's soul draining for me because I've been doing it for 12 years now and I've built all of the processes. And I know I could hire someone to do that stuff. Um, at the same time, at this point, because of what happened last year and you know the $2 million in losses and so on and so forth and everything, I've restructured some of the ways I do things and I didn't want to bring in a chief of ops into something that isn't in a place where they could just go, right? Um, just, hey, this is it, it's working, it's making 10 million a year, just take it to 100 million and I'll coach you through it, right? And so on. So um, we can be wary of the things that we do and don't want to do. When you have to, easy, you have to, you know, you need to make ends meet. When you don't have to, oh gosh, careful, be very careful. <laughs> Absolutely. So I guess that just, uh, and again, I wonder if you be conscious of time, but just for the sake of, let's just say this segment, et cetera, because I think this is actually a really cool conversation because it's like so many of the clients that I work with, many of them have aspirations to get to where you are and not even necessarily just in terms of like numbers and, and like business size, but in this sort of just kind of like the, the, the attitude, the, the mindset, the, the state with which you're bringing, at least to this conversation with regards to how you approach um, everything. Like it, it's lighthearted is the wrong word for it, but I think it's just kind of like very settled, very grounded with regards to how you approach everything. It's, it's like a really cool, like just illustration of like, okay, this is sort of where that can lead to, like this kind of work, that this kind of experience, all this can lead to. So I think it's very cool from that perspective. So what I would then bring to, to you or bring into this space is like, okay, so given that you are in that state and you mentioned uh, before we started going this call, it's kind of like, okay, everybody's got head trash I need to work through. Everybody's got their issues. Like if you say you don't, you're, like, you're likely lying or just unaware. So what I'm curious then is somebody who is at where so many people aspire to be, like what are the things that you struggle with now? <clears throat> Some of the string things I struggle with. So um, one is I've struggled a lot with um, forgiving the people responsible for all of the headache and drama and you know money losses and reputation losses and so on and so forth right because they did it intentionally malicious intent right uh, someone being un incompetent i perfectly can get over it and i've had many people being incompetent and i spent so much money on them and so on easy to get over because they were just simply incompetent right but some of these guys that caused these issues malicious intent and very hard to get over because I am sorry, not hard to get over. Probably other people just, you know, get over it and so on, you know, just tomorrow's another day. But for me, um, it, it was not easy at all because of I've built this, you know, over a decade and then someone just trashed it, like literally just threw it through the ground. You know, we lost so many good clients, you know, we had to go back two years, you know, of progress was basically erased and so on. And I'm like, interesting. This can actually happen, right? And this is when many times, this is when people suicide, right? Or they go into depression or things like that because all of a sudden they were here. Like, imagine I was like 30, already a DECA millionaire, you know, no problem, you know, everything just going as it should. And then 32, I'm not as wealthy as I was when I was 30, right? So like, mm, you know, um, it already you know rubs you the wrong way. Uh, like, oh, I should be at you know, 50 million by now, whatever. Whatever stories you tell yourself. So that was not easy at all. Um, obviously, I can tell everyone listening that any form of grudge or frustration towards someone else is, in fact, in you. <laughs> every time, every time, no exception. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being the bearer of bad news. Always you, always you. 
um, never once was someone else responsible for your frustration. It's you. You're generating your own frustration. And so to accept that you were so bad at something or a specific group of things that made you lose so much time and money and reputation and so on, very hard to swallow, very hard. Because here you were, at least in my case, here I was eight years of growth year after year after year after you just growing 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 you know just people were throwing money at me anything i would touch would turn to gold and it still does by the way not that didn't change but then this happened right and i lose some i lost reputation and uh, uh face with some wealthy millionaires you know in in various other places that were in my network a strong part of my network because of it um and it's like very difficult to swallow that's that's for me at least it was i'm not sure i swallowed it yet just because i'm not where i was before and i don't know this is me keeping myself in that like in that defensive stance you know with my shield up until i get back to where i was because two years ago if i wanted to spend half a million dollars or something i just could literally i'm not joking right very like no 30-year-old can say that. Statistically speaking, no one can say that, right? There are the, the number of billionaires or multimillionaires at 30, self-made, by the way, not inherited, is so small. They, they, you only read about them because that's the only people that are mentioned in the news. But they're so small, statistically speaking, that no one actually does that. So I was there. And then now, any investment I need to make, I need to think twice because I, I had the, the cash crunch. Right, uh, and I we're still going back. We're in a much better place. Business is going well. It's growing every month. It's fine. We're paying back the debt that we got. We we're at half the debt we were last year, right at this time. So we're very good. We're paying back everything. No one pays back debt as fast as I am. <laughs> Again, another you know, it's just it just happens. It's just rolling. However, in my brain, in my mental trash, or however you want to call it. I'm still keeping that sort of against myself until I get back, right? Until I can say, sweetheart, do you want to, you know, go to Greece for three weeks? I don't need to be anywhere. Do you want to just go? <laughs> you know, until I get back to that, you know, I'm literally in a place where, um, and I don't know if this is good or bad, Grasco, right? You could tell me or we can, you know, tell the audience, but um, I really want to get back. Once you lose something that's that delicious, you know, like it's you've tasted it, it's like the forbidden fruit is like, I want that again. You know, it's very addictive. It's very addictive to have all the money you can ever spend, you know, like you never feel need. It's just super cool. Even right now, I could just go and levitate on, you know, money I have for a long time and I could easily make ends meet. No problem. Anyone would, again, pay me thousands of dollars. People reach out to me all the time for consulting and so on to help them grow their businesses. No problem, right? But um, at the same time, it's just you have your own standard, right? And so my standard has not been met as it where it was, you know, a little over a year ago. So I want to get back to that. And then from there, we'll see. Absolutely. And I think that's actually perfect. So from the outside looking in, I guess the follow up question there would be because you started the conversation saying, well, okay, well, I, it's hard for me to forgive the people that have created this drama and kind of put me in this situation. So the follow-up question I would have is like, are you really like, is this really about forgiving the people or is it forgiving yourself about the fall from grace? Yourself, yourself. But that, that's the thing. So the symptom is forgiving them because they're really malicious and so on and so forth. The root cause is that I did it. I did. I looked the other way when they didn't hit their KPIs. You know, I yeah. didn't want to have the difficult conversation. I, 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 and I see it backtracking, you know, looking, Looking, it was like, why, why, dude? Like, you knew what you had to do. Why didn't you just do it? Just do it. Like, what happened? Why? And I realized that I was dealing with narcissists. And it's very interesting because I don't know if you know, narcissists are uh, psychopaths or whatever, or social or something like that. Psychopaths, I think. It's psychopathic, you know, narcissism. They go hand in hand. And it's another one. I can't remember which one, but there's a triangle that all any 
psychopath is also a narcissist. Every narcissist is also a psychopath, and so on and so forth. And they, there's one more I can't remember right now. It's a triangle. So within, within this, I realized that I did not have the capability to spot, number one, and to deal with narcissists. I just didn't know. It's literally like the moment I realized that, I kid you not, half of the forgiveness already happened because I realized I really didn't know that, that these people are so professional at lying. They literally have a PhD in, in lying, in, in skewing the facts and getting you confused and making you blame yourself for whatever it is, like you should have done better, whatever. And I, I couldn't believe it. And then I talked to a psychiatrist not long ago. I, not, not for me, but I think it was like a connection, a mutual connection or whatever. And we just hopped on a call and I, you know, we just shared some things. And she told me how to spot a narcissist, how to deal with them, and so on and so forth. At the moment she said those things, I'm like, wow, finally I understand what happened. Finally. Because for a year I didn't know what happened. I was so confused because that never happened to me until then. But then I realized what happened. I'm like, wow, okay, so now I know this. So now I picked up this skill, which now I have the skill of spotting and dealing with narcissists. Okay. Perfect. Imagine how much that will help me in the future. Tremendously. Worth much more than the $2 million I spent on the lesson. Could I have not spent $2 million to learn that lesson? 100%. I could have just gotten a psychiatrist. She would have told me, you know, hey, they are this or something else or whatever. Have a coaching call with you. You know, it doesn't matter. Something that I could have done. And, and then, you know, just dealt with it. But uh, again, um, I was dealing with other things. I was growing my portfolio in other ways, you know, whilst some businesses were going down, others were booming, you know, and it's, it's not all bad. You know, it was great. It was, yeah, I lost $2 million, but I made millions more, you know? So it's at the same time, I was busy with other things, but that's no excuse as you and I both know. It's, it's your business. It's your responsibility. You own it, deal with it, right? If you don't want to be responsible, sell it, <laughs> you know, otherwise just be responsible for it. Absolutely. And I think it's a beautiful example of the whole sentiment of like, you win or learn, right? So this is, I lost, but I learned a lot from this. I think the fact that you recognize it's an honest mistake, like I've never come across narcissists before. They're actually really good at what they do, which is what makes them a narcissist. So it's kind of like a, an honest mistake because you don't know what you don't know. And you're at a disadvantage because they're better at that lying game than I am because I'm somebody that has the integrity to not do that. So then I guess my follow-up question from that is, so then what what's like what are you having trouble forgiving yourself for? Letting down the people in my life. It hurts me to this day. I let down so many people. And I think that's why I'm sticking to this because I haven't made it back to them. Right. I've I've let down people in my life. I was on a I was on a roller coaster, you know, I was at the top of the world, you know, I made plans, I, I did things, you know, I did everything I, and I said, let's do this, let's do that, whatever, right? And then all of that happened, and it delayed everything by a couple of years. And I think this, that's very important. I'm sorry. just going to cut you off, not because I, I want to cut you off, just because just of time, right? I, I think that's just a very important distinction, because it's kind of like wherever your focus goes, that's where your brain's going to look for solutions. Right. And if you see like the this last part of the conversation, like it starts with, OK, so forgiving the malicious people, which turned into, OK, well, I take self-responsibility. There was a lot of things I had to learn here and I would be OK if I made the money back. But really what's behind making the money back is actually like that is a visual representation. That is an objective representation of getting back to baseline with the people that I actually hurt. Right. So if, if we're looking to. Yeah. Okay, well, how do I get back to that equanimity? How do I get back to not being high, not being low? From the outside looking in, it's like what I'm making this mistake mean is I have somehow hurt people. And I'm not saying there weren't consequences to this at all, but it's just the part that you're harboring isn't actually about the money. It's just like when I make the money back, then I can put closure on hurting the people that I've hurt. So I think it's like, if you want to heal this, now really let go of it fully it's to begin to look at the threads around well, what does this actually mean about how i hurt people to what degree have i hurt them to what degree it is still hurting 
Um, that that would be my invitation from the outside looking in based off of what you've shared so far. I already have a plan for everyone. So uh, the people that have lost money during that with, you know, the ventures that we had and so on, I already have a plan for each one of them. The people that, you know, have suffered in other ways, you know, I can make it back to them in other ways and so on. So I already have a plan for each person. It's just I'm not there yet. So the plans are postponed until I'm in a place where I can just go to someone and say, hey, look, this is what we I want to do, you know, to make back for this uh, event, right? And so that's basically where I am. And I think that's a beautiful thing, right? It's like a, proactively taking the responsibility to, to to make those things, right? And uh, yeah, I think it, it's a beautiful share of something that like, it's kind of like, welcome to being human, wh- whether it's like, it, it, it's a relational thing, or it's a thing with a lot of zeros behind it. It's like the, the, the human part of the pain is, is the same. And it's geared towards around the narrative that's there. So I think it's a beautiful example of how you can take ownership of, um, you know, something like that. So I know we can dive deeper into all of this, but just for the sake of time, I want to make sure that that we're finishing this um, on time. And if there's anything else you want to add or, or comment to that, by all means, floor is yours. And then we can kind of wrap it up from there. So um, I think on my end, um, the moment you believe that you know is is a very dangerous moment. If you think that you know marketing, you know sales, you know ops, you know people, you know something, incredibly dangerous. I realized if more than anything else, I've realized that I know nothing. There is a, you know, you were mentioning quotes, you know, uh, uh, earlier, that to come to the, re- really come to the realization. I thought I knew this, yet I found myself, oh, I know how to do this. No. <laughs> no, you don't know. You cannot know. The moment you understand you, you cannot know for sure anything, it's so empowering. Because then all of a sudden, knowing that you don't know immediately makes you humble. It, you can't have one with the other. You cannot have the knowledge that you don't know anything about anything else, right? You're always learning. You always have to learn and have to be better. And then, and and humility, it just, it, it's on the same wavelength. It's, you cannot have one without the other so two years ago up or up until two years ago i i still had certain fantasies about you know playing video games and you know and, and just i don't have anything else to do i'll just do this maybe i would have started to get cocky arrogant you know who knows because 30 year old deca millionaire you know, who are you to tell me how, how to... <laughs> you know it just you have everything figured out. Like you really do. If, if you're a DECA millionaire by 30 and you're dirt poor when you're young, you know, you really figured it out. I mean, come on, kudos to you. You know, whatever happens after 30, but kudos to you, you figured it out. Well done, right? And, and then arrogance can kick in and you really need to be careful for that, right? So uh, if anyone's on my journey or anywhere, you know, on this path, you know, they're free to just Google my name. They'll, the first three pages of Google are all about me or they could go to my website and you know email me at robertindesh.com. I'd love to obviously share and say like, hey, you know, I've been there. <laughs> I've done that, you know, like don't, don't beat yourself up for it. It's not worth it, you know. Uh, I, I'd love to help anyone, you know, obviously go through, that's going through anything, you know, like, like this. I can't help you with raising children because I don't have, of my own, we are trying to you know do that now. This is our latest family project right now. Um, but I, if it comes to business or anything like that, you know, hundred percent, I can can be of service. Um, and I think that's where what it comes down to to remain humble. You know, like you're very humble doing this podcast. You know, um, I'm sure you've impacted a lot of lives. You know, uh, uh, guests and listeners alike, right? So it's like if you remember, if we remember to be humble, to do good, you know changes the perspective of life to a place where you just wake up and like what can i do today you know you get excited love it well couldn't have said it uh better myself so robert thank you very much i mean this was this was a different episode that that i normally do and i like that and it just for the same reason i said it before right because it's such a great aspirational perspective of like okay this is what uh it can lead to and i think I say this often to guests where they're like, okay, you're very self-aware, but then there's like these other pieces. 
But for you, I think you have a very good sense of like, okay, if I'm aware of something and I learn something, the gap between that and then actually like implementing and doing something with it is like very, very small, right? Which is super cool. Because again, that's exactly what I coach uh, my clients to go through, which is usually like, they'll be aware of a lot of things, but then the gap between like making that into results is, is quite large. And there's a lot of drama that goes into why you know, that is. And I think a big part of your success is because you've been able to make that gap as small as possible. Um, like I, I could see it just in the course of the things, like how you speak about things and the connections you make and, and what you bring out. So kudos to you. This is actually a cool conversation for me with regards to like listening to that and seeing where it can go. And, and I think it's aspirational for a lot of clients. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming on. Thank you as well. Awesome. All right. Well, for everybody else listening, we'll see you on the next one.